Hi there, and welcome to part three of the Quick Start tutorial guide for Motion Symphony. In this tutorial, we're talking specifically about optimization with motion matching. In the last two Quick Start guides, we set up a character with run locomotion and walk locomotion in the same animation graph. So let's look at how we can have this optimized. If we play our, um, if we run around now, we can actually see there are a lot of poses being searched. In the top left, there is the pose search debug. To get that up, press tilde, type a.animnode.mosynth, and then mmsearch.debug, uh, and then type one. And we can see there are 16,559 poses being searched every motion matching update. Now this is a lot of poses and therefore it can become quite uh, CPU heavy if we're linearly searching through every one of these poses every frame. So let's start by looking at how we can optimize our motion matching with Motion Symphony from the simplest to the most complex way. The first thing we're going to do is look at the motion matching node itself. We can first look at the update interval. Now I've got it set to 0.3. This is like three and a half times per second, which is actually really low. I would usually run it at 0.1, so 10 hertz. So every 0.1 seconds, the motion matching search is going to take place. Um, and this is a pretty good point for me. I wouldn't go higher than 0.033. Uh, this is basically 30, uh, 30 updates per second or 30 hertz because you're not really getting that much benefit. Imagine if a game is running at 144 hertz or even uh, 80 uh, hertz frames per second and it's updating every single frame. That's a lot of searches that are just not necessary. In between searches, we can just keep playing the current animation we are on. So yeah, if we set this to zero, it's going to update every frame. And I just don't think it's necessary. Start at 0 0.1 seconds and uh, you won't have a motion matching search every frame. In this case, even if you only had, your game was only running at 30 frames per second, that means you could have three characters actually updating on different frames altogether. And you save and you spread the load over different frames and also different threads. So let's look at the, uh, actually before we move on, let's talk about this a bit more. So for a player character, you should probably keep it pretty low. Um, in this case, 0 0.1, as I find is pretty good. Maybe you could go a bit lower. But for an AI character, you're not really going to notice. If I even put this up to 0 0.5, which is very high, uh, so it's only two, updating two times per second, uh, it's going to be real, relatively unresponsive. But for an AI character that is a long way in the distance with you know a low LOD, it still looks pretty good. The animation doesn't look bad. Uh, it's just unresponsive. So for your own character, yeah, you want to keep that pretty low. So I'll put that back to 0 0.1. Now, the other thing we option we have here is the pose tolerance test. Now, this basically is a test that checks if the, uh, the next pose in our natural animation if that trajectory matches our desired trajectory within a certain tolerance, just keep playing the trajectory. I also sometimes call this the good enough test. If the next pose in our natural current animation is good enough, don't bother searching. We just skip that search altogether and keep playing the current animation. Now, there are a few tolerance values that we can set for that. In this case, this is tolerance in the difference between the next pose's trajectory and your desired trajectory. We already know that the next pose in any animation sequentially is going to be a really good pose. So we don't need to check that. We only check the trajectory. In this case, I've set 100 centimeters difference. If the two trajectories are greater than 100 centimeters difference in total, then it's uh, going to search. If it's less than that, it's not going to search. And this is the rotation tolerance is for facing angles. So five degrees in this case. And yeah, we can just check this and uncheck this. And what you'll find is that when your character runs straight, uh, there's not going to be as many searches, especially if you have a really good solid loop. Um, there's no really way to tell right now if that's working, but usually when you run straight, especially if you have a, a cut loop that runs perfectly straight and loops perfectly, while running straight, you could effectively um, never search until the user changes direction or something. So whenever the user is doing a consistent input and not changing their input all the time, it's going to skip a lot of searches and save on a lot of CPU time. So these are really basic, really easy to set up optimizations uh, that you can control. 
The next optimization, which has a little bit more manual work, but is very easy to understand, is do not use poses. Now we've looked at do not use poses plenty and more for curating your animation database, but it also allows us to get rid of redundancy. So what I mean by that is we already have a run cycle animation here and it's got a decent uh, run animation with several cycles. I'd recommend making a loop and uh, having three, four, five cycles within that loop for variation. And that's all you really need for when you're running straight. You don't need uh, a lot more than that. However, if we look at these other animations, these are run start stops, we're getting running loops in between each one. And while these running loops are necessary for pre-processing the trajectory, we don't really need to play them at runtime. And therefore we can cull a lot of poses before we even get to runtime um, by just tagging up sections of do not use. Now I haven't done it in the quick start tutorial too much because it can take a bit of time. However, it is going to significantly reduce the uh, number of poses you have. Another good example is run start stop. So in this case, we have a, you know, a forward start, we have a left start and a left 135 degree start. However, you'll notice at the end of each one, there's a stop. And we tend to get lots and lots of stop animations. And especially if we're using mirroring, double that again. So it's kind of important that, you know, we have enough stop animations to have the diversity we need for our motion matching, but there becomes a point where the redundancy is too much and it's just extra poses that you don't need that are gonna be searched and taking up CPU time. So I highly recommend checking out the example project and I'll show you right now, I've already set this up and done all the tagging. And I find, you can see here, I've tagged out a whole bunch of sections in pretty much every single animation, just getting rid of that redundancy um, in the animation. So in this case, I've used this this animation for the start stop of just a, a uh, what is it? This is actually a 45 degree right start, but I've tagged out the middle section because I don't need that. And I also don't need um, any of this idle stuff at the end, for example, tagged out the idle, and the plants, I've just tagged out the sections in between. So you can see that by doing that, I'm reducing the pose count by quite a lot. So that is the simple manual ways you can do optimization. And now we're going to look at the built-in like sort of automated way. It is still modular, so you still need to turn it on, but um, it is it does mostly just work by itself. So we'll open up our motion atom data and under optimization, we can click the optimize button and we're going to add an optimization module. Now it's important to understand that this kind of optimization here happens all in the pre-process stage. It takes our big list of poses, our linear list, and uh, processes, processes it and structures it in a way that can be searched really quickly. Um, so if we click on the drop down here, we can make an MM optimization multi-clustering asset or mm optimization underscore trait bins. Now the trait bins one is very simple. It only separates animations by traits and calls all the do not use poses. So they're not even being checked, uh, but it's more of a base case for testing. And it can also be used if you want to make your own custom optimization. I suggest looking at the source code for the trait bins to see how a really simple module could be made. The multi-clustering is a more advanced technique where there's multiple steps of clustering in the algorithm. And um, we basically, at the end, we get a lookup table with, you know, a fraction, you know, ten, five to 10% of the poses being searched at once or even, even less in some cases. So let's just create that optimization module and I'll create it here and call it tutorial optimization. Now, both the trait bins and the multi-clustering one are going to separate them. They're going to have different structures internally for traits. So if you're using traits, you're, you're, you are optimizing, you're going to use, uh, be searching less poses as well. We can actually just pre-process that. That is ready to go. It is going to take a lot longer to pre-process, but by a lot longer, I mean still under a minute, uh, depending on the number of poses you have which is still pretty decent. If you want to iterate on this faster and you don't want to wait one minute every time, uncheck the optimize button. And then when you're ready to have it, and when you've finished your iterations, like say you're doing a day of work and you're iterating it on it a lot, and before you want to commit maybe to your project, you tick the optimization button and you pre-process and it takes you know, 30 seconds to a minute 
So that is now pre-processed. Let's check out how that is performing. I'll hit play and we can see these flashes of uh, trajectories on the floor. Every time those trajectories flashes, that is another pose search being done. And in the top left, we can see a little bit more information. So we still have a total number of poses of 16,000. However, the poses being searched every frame is changing and it ranges between a low of about 500 to a high of about 120. Seems like we're getting an average of about 900 with a 94, 95% reduction in pose searches. So we combine, uh, sorry, poses being searched. So we combine this with our other optimization methods and we're able to get quite a lot out of motion matching, especially if we have multiple characters spreading the load over different frames um, and different threads. So um, we can actually improve on this a lot. So as I said, I hadn't done all the do not use tagging on this particular motion data during the quick start tutorial because that takes a lot of time. However, I will quickly show you what it looks like on a character that has had a little bit more work done on it. So we'll go to this character and this is the one that is in the example project. And you can see we're only getting between, uh, you know, five, it's usually around seven, 750, 800 average but a low of 250 and a high of 1000 poses being searched every frame. If we go to walking, it's even less. We got a low of 90 and a high of 800, but an average of about 500 poses searched every frame. That's a 96% reduction in poses. So with everything combined, we can get some pretty good performance and, um, and yeah. One more thing before we finish up, you'll notice now that I'm walking straight, there aren't many of the flashes of trajectories on the ground. And this is an example of the next pose tolerance test working really well. It's skipping a whole bunch of searches and it's only searching every about um, six seconds. And basically that's because it's coming to the end of the animation. If this was a loop, it would probably not search again until I change direction. So with that all said, I hope you now better understand how you can improve the performance of your motion matching with Motion Symphony. There's a lot of tools in place and I hope this tutorial has given you the information you need for that. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next and final quick start tutorial where we'll set up a character with cut clips.